This video is a collection of documentaries of the world's most iconic sites. Please don't forget to like this video, share it, and subscribe to our channel. Thank you. The first documentary is on the Great Zimbabwe Ruins, given by my wife. The Great Zimbabwe Ruins, located in the southeastern part of Zimbabwe, are a testament to the rich history and culture of Africa. These ruins, which are estimated to be over 800 years old, are a fascinating example of the architectural and artistic achievements of the ancient African civilization that once inhabited the region. Today, they remain one of the most important historical sites on the continent, attracting visitors from all over the world who are eager to learn more about Africa's glorious past. One of the most popular and enduring legends surrounding the Great Zimbabwe Ruins is that they were once a lost city of gold. The legend of the lost city of gold in Zimbabwe has been captivating people for centuries. According to the legend, the city was once a thriving metropolis, filled with untold riches and treasures, including vast amounts of gold. The inhabitants of the city were said to have hidden away these treasures before they fled the city, and many people have attempted to find them over the years. Despite extensive searches and excavations, however, the lost city of gold has never been found, leaving many to wonder if it ever truly existed. The legend of the lost city of gold in Zimbabwe has its roots in the history of the region. Zimbabwe was once home to a powerful and sophisticated civilization known as the Kingdom of Zimbabwe. This kingdom flourished between the 11th and 15th centuries, and its people were skilled in agriculture, mining, and trade. They built large stone structures, including the famous Great Zimbabwe Ruins, which were a testament to their engineering and architectural prowess. The Kingdom of Zimbabwe was also known for its gold mines. The region was rich in gold deposits, and the kingdom's rulers were able to amass vast amounts of wealth from mining and trade. This wealth allowed them to build impressive structures and establish a powerful and influential civilization. Over time, however, the kingdom began to decline. Various factors, including climate change, political instability, and economic decline, contributed to its downfall. By the 15th century, the kingdom had collapsed, and its people had dispersed. It is believed that the legend of the lost city of gold in Zimbabwe arose as a result of the wealth and power of the kingdom of Zimbabwe. The idea of a city filled with gold and other treasures was too tempting for explorers and adventurers to resist, and many attempted to find the lost city over the years. One of the most famous attempts to find the lost city of gold was made by the Portuguese explorer, João de Barros. In the early 16th century, Barros heard rumors of a city filled with gold in the region and decided to set out in search of it. He traveled through the area for several months, but was unable to find the city. Despite his failure, however, the legend of the lost city of gold persisted, and many others continued to search for it over the centuries. Today, the lost city of gold remains one of the enduring mysteries of Zimbabwe's history. While there is no evidence to suggest that the city ever truly existed, the legend continues to inspire people to search for it. The story of the lost city of gold also serves as a reminder of the rich history and culture of Zimbabwe and the African continent as a whole. In recent years, there has been a renewed interest in the history of Zimbabwe and the Kingdom of Zimbabwe. Archaeologists and historians have been studying the Great Zimbabwe ruins and other sites in the region, in an effort to gain a better understanding of the civilization that once thrived there. These efforts have revealed many new insights into the history of the region and have helped to dispel some of the myths and legends that have surrounded it. Despite the fact that the lost city of gold in Zimbabwe may never be found, the legend of its existence will likely continue to captivate people for years to come.
As long as there are tales of lost treasures and ancient civilizations, the legend of the lost city of gold will endure as a reminder of the power of myth and the enduring allure of the past. Another title for the Great Zimbabwe Ruins is A Window into Africa's Glorious Past. This title reflects the idea that the ruins offer a unique glimpse into the rich and diverse history of Africa, which has often been overlooked or forgotten in Western narratives. The Great Zimbabwe Ruins are a reminder that Africa has a long and proud history that deserves to be celebrated and studied. They provide an opportunity for visitors to learn more about the achievements of ancient African civilizations and to appreciate the beauty and complexity of their art, architecture, and culture. The Great Zimbabwe Ruins are also known as the Enigma of the Great Zimbabwe, exploring a forgotten civilization. Despite the wealth of archaeological evidence that has been gathered about the site, much about the civilization that built it remains a mystery. Historians and archaeologists are still trying to piece together the story of the great Zimbabwe people, including their origins, their way of life, and the reasons for the decline of their civilization. The ruins offer tantalizing clues and hints about the culture and society of this ancient people, but much about them remains unknown. African Wonder of the World the Great Zimbabwe Ruins is another fitting title for this historic site. The Great Zimbabwe Ruins are a marvel of architecture and engineering, with massive stone walls, intricate carvings, and complex structures that have withstood the test of time. They are a testament to the ingenuity and creativity of the people who built them and a reminder of the impressive achievements of African civilizations throughout history. The ruins are a source of pride and wonder for the people of Zimbabwe and for all Africans who appreciate the rich cultural heritage of the continent. Uncovering the Great Zimbabwe, The Secrets of a Mysterious Kingdom is a title that highlights the ongoing efforts of historians and archaeologists to unravel the mysteries of the Great Zimbabwe ruins. These efforts involve a wide range of research techniques, including archaeological excavation, radiocarbon dating, and historical analysis. Through these methods, researchers hope to gain a better understanding of the people who built the ruins and the society and culture that they lived in. This ongoing work promises to reveal many new insights into the history of Zimbabwe and Africa as a whole. A Journey Through Time the Great Zimbabwe Ruins is a title that captures the sense of wonder and discovery that visitors experience when exploring the site. Walking through the ruins is like taking a journey back in time, to a world that is both familiar and strange. The ruins offer a unique opportunity to experience the history and culture of Africa in a visceral and tangible way. Visitors can see the ruins up close, touch the stones that were laid by ancient hands, and imagine what life must have been like in this distant and exotic place. The Legacy of the Great Zimbabwe, an African Empire Rediscovered is a title that captures the enduring importance of the Great Zimbabwe ruins for the people of Zimbabwe and for all Africans. The ruins are a symbol of the rich cultural heritage of the continent and a reminder of the achievements of ancient African civilizations. They are also a source of inspiration for modern African artists, musicians, and writers, who draw on the imagery and symbolism of the ruins in their work. The legacy of the Great Zimbabwe extends beyond the borders of Zimbabwe and Africa, as the ruins have become a global icon of African history and culture. By rediscovering and celebrating the legacy of the Great Zimbabwe, Africans can gain a greater appreciation for their own cultural heritage and a deeper understanding of their place in the world. In conclusion, the Great Zimbabwe Ruins are a testament to the rich history and cultural heritage of Zimbabwe and Africa as a whole. They are a source of inspiration for modern African artists, musicians, and writers, and a symbol of the achievements of ancient African civilizations. The ruins offer a glimpse into the past, providing us with a window into a glorious African civilization that thrived more than six centuries ago.
Despite the fact that the Great Zimbabwe Ruins have faced many challenges over the years, they remain an important cultural and historical site, and a popular destination for tourists from around the world. Efforts to preserve and protect the ruins have been ongoing, and today they are recognized as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. This recognition has helped to raise awareness of the importance of the ruins and to ensure that they will be protected and celebrated for generations to come. Overall, the Great Zimbabwe Ruins serve as a powerful reminder of the rich history and cultural heritage of Africa. They are a testament to the ingenuity, creativity, and resilience of the people who built them, and a source of inspiration for all those who seek to understand the past and to build a better future. By studying and celebrating the legacy of the Great Zimbabwe, we can gain a deeper appreciation for the diversity and richness of African culture, and a greater understanding of our place in the world. This documentary is on the Berlin Wall, given by Billy Joey. The construction of the Berlin Wall was a pivotal moment in the history of the Cold War. The wall, which was erected on August 13, 1961, divided the city of Berlin into east and west, and represented the height of tensions between the Soviet Union and the Western powers. The origins of the Berlin Wall can be traced back to the end of World War II. After the defeat of Nazi Germany, the Allied powers divided Berlin and the rest of Germany into four occupation zones. The city of Berlin, which was located deep within the Soviet zone, was also divided into four zones. The United States, Great Britain, and France occupied the western sectors of Berlin, while the Soviet Union occupied the eastern sector. In the years that followed, tensions between the Soviet Union and the western powers grew. The Soviet Union saw the presence of the Western powers in Berlin as a threat and wanted them to leave. The Western powers, on the other hand, saw their presence in Berlin as essential to maintaining a strong presence in Europe. In 1948, the Soviet Union attempted to force the Western powers out of Berlin by blockading the city. The Western powers responded by airlifting supplies to the people of Berlin, and the blockade was eventually lifted. However, the tension between the Soviet Union and the Western powers continued to simmer. In the years that followed, millions of East Germans left their country to escape the communist regime. Many of these people traveled to West Berlin, where they could cross into West Germany and start a new life. This flow of refugees was a significant embarrassment to the communist government of East Germany, and it threatened the stability of the entire Soviet bloc. In response to this situation, the East German government, with the support of the Soviet Union, decided to build a wall to prevent people from leaving. On August 13, 1961, the construction of the Berlin Wall began. The initial construction of the wall was a chaotic and haphazard affair. The East German government had not planned the construction in advance, and so the first sections of the wall were built quickly and without much precision. The first sections of the wall were made of barbed wire, and were meant to serve as a temporary barrier. However, as the days and weeks passed, the wall was expanded and fortified. The construction of the Berlin Wall was a massive undertaking. Over the years, the wall would stretch for more than 100 miles and would include numerous guard towers, watchtowers, and other fortifications. The wall was built to be an impenetrable barrier, with no fewer than 12 different layers of security measures designed to prevent people from escaping. The building of the wall had a profound impact on the people of Berlin. Families and friends were separated, and people who had lived their entire lives in the city found themselves trapped on one side or the other. The wall became a powerful symbol of the Iron Curtain that separated the capitalist West from the communist East. The construction of the Berlin Wall also had a significant impact on the rest of the world. It heightened tensions between the Soviet Union and the Western powers, and raised fears of a potential military conflict. The Western powers condemned the construction of the wall, but were unable to prevent it from being built. The Berlin Wall also had a significant impact on the relationship between East and West Germany. Before the construction of the wall, people could move freely between East and West Berlin. After the wall was built, the two sides became increasingly isolated from each other and tensions between the two Germanys grew. In the years that followed, 
the Berlin Wall became a symbol of oppression and tyranny. The East German government used the wall as a way to control its citizens, and it was a constant reminder of the political and ideological tensions that fueled the Cold War. The fall of the Berlin Wall is one of the most significant events of the 20th century. It marked the end of the Cold War and the beginning of a new era in European history. The wall had separated East and West Berlin since 1961, and its fall on November 9, 1989, was a symbolic moment that signified the reunification of Germany and the end of Soviet domination in Eastern Europe. The Berlin Wall was erected in 1961 by the communist government of East Germany to prevent citizens from fleeing to the West. It was a physical barrier that stretched for more than 100 miles, encircling West Berlin and dividing the city in two. The wall was a brutal symbol of the Iron Curtain that separated the capitalist West from the communist East. It was also a reminder of the political and ideological tensions that had fueled the Cold War. For years, the Berlin Wall was a potent symbol of the East-West divide. It represented a stark contrast between the prosperous, democratic West and the impoverished, authoritarian East. Many people in East Germany dreamed of escaping to the West, where they would be free from the constraints of communism and could pursue their dreams. However, Attempting to cross the Berlin Wall was a dangerous and illegal act that could result in imprisonment, torture, or death. The fall of the Berlin Wall began in Hungary in the summer of 1989. Hungary, which was also part of the Soviet bloc, had recently opened its borders with Austria, allowing East Germans to escape to the West. This decision by the Hungarian government set off a wave of protests and demonstrations in East Germany, as citizens demanded more freedom and an end to the oppressive communist regime. On November 4, 1989, half a million people gathered in East Berlin for a peaceful protest against the government. The protest, which was organized by opposition groups, was the largest in East German history. The demonstrators called for democracy, freedom of speech, and an end to the communist regime. The protest ended peacefully, but it was clear that the East German government was losing control of the situation. On November 9, 1989, the government announced that citizens would be allowed to travel to the West without restriction. This decision came as a surprise to many people, and the news spread quickly throughout East Germany. Thousands of East Germans flocked to the Berlin Wall that evening, demanding to be let through. The border guards, who had no instructions on how to deal with the situation, were overwhelmed by the crowds. In a moment that would be broadcast around the world, the guards eventually gave in and opened the gates, allowing people to cross freely between East and West Berlin. The fall of the Berlin Wall was a moment of great joy and celebration. People danced on top of the wall, embracing each other and waving flags. The symbolism of the event was not lost on anyone, as it signified the end of the Cold War and the beginning of a new era of freedom and democracy in Europe. The fall of the Berlin Wall also had far-reaching political consequences. It led to the reunification of Germany, which had been divided since the end of World War II. The reunification process was not without challenges, but it was ultimately successful, and Germany emerged as a strong, united nation in the heart of Europe. The fall of the Berlin Wall also had a significant impact on the rest of Europe. It signaled the end of Soviet domination in Eastern Europe and paved the way for the peaceful democratization of the region. Within a few years, communist regimes had fallen in many countries, and new democracies had emerged. The fall of the Berlin Wall was a moment of hope and optimism. It showed that change was possible, even in the face of seemingly insurmountable obstacles. This documentary is on the Moai statues, given by my wife.
The Rapa Nui people believed that the spirits of their ancestors lived on in the statues and that the statues served as a sort of conduit between the living and the dead. Another theory suggests that the Moai statues were constructed as a way of marking important sites, such as sources of fresh water or places of spiritual significance. The statues may have served as a sort of map or guide to these sites, helping travelers navigate the island. Regardless of their purpose, the Moai statues remain a testament to the ingenuity and creativity of the Rapa Nui people. The construction and transportation of these massive statues would have required a great deal of skill and organization, as well as a deep understanding of the natural resources of the island. Despite their cultural and historical significance, the Moai statues have faced a number of challenges over the years. Many of the statues were damaged or destroyed by European explorers in the 18th and 19th centuries, who saw the statues as symbols of paganism and sought to destroy them. Others were damaged by natural disasters, such as earthquakes and landslides. Today, efforts are being made to preserve and protect the Moai statues. The Rapa Nui people, in collaboration with the Chilean government, have established a number of conservation efforts aimed at preserving the statues for future generations. These efforts include measures to prevent erosion, protect against natural disasters, and promote sustainable tourism. The Moai statues are a true wonder of the world, a testament to the creativity and ingenuity of an ancient people. Despite the challenges they have faced over the years, the Moai statues continue to stand as a testament to the ingenuity and creativity of the Rapa Nui people, and remain an iconic symbol of Easter Island's rich cultural heritage. This documentary is on the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, given by my wife. The Hanging Gardens of Babylon are one of the most famous and mysterious architectural wonders of the ancient world. According to legend, these gardens were built in the 6th century BC by King Nebuchadnezzar II in the ancient city of Babylon, which is now located in modern-day Iraq. The gardens were said to have been built to please the king's wife, Amy Tiz, who missed the lush greenery of her homeland. The Hanging Gardens are said to have been a breathtaking sight, with lush greenery, exotic plants, and intricate water features. Although the Hanging Gardens of Babylon were considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, their existence has long been debated by scholars. There is no physical evidence of the gardens, and the descriptions given by ancient writers and travelers are often vague and contradictory. The first re Despite the lack of physical evidence, many historians and archaeologists believe that the Hanging Gardens of Babylon did in fact exist. They point to the fact that ancient writers such as Herodotus and Diodorus Siculus were generally reliable, and that their accounts of the gardens are consistent with other descriptions of ancient Babylonian architecture and engineering.
One theory suggests that the Hanging Gardens of Babylon were actually a series of terraced gardens that were built along the banks of the Euphrates River. This would have allowed for easy access to water, and would have created a natural slope for the gardens to be built on. The terraces would have been supported by brick or stone columns, and the soil would have been held in place by wooden planks. Another theory suggests that the Hanging Gardens of Babylon were actually a series of roof gardens, which were a common feature of Babylonian architecture at the time. These gardens would have been built on top of buildings, and would have been irrigated by a system of channels and reservoirs. Regardless of the exact design of the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, it is clear that they would have been a remarkable feat of engineering and architecture. The gardens would have required a vast amount of resources and manpower to build, as well as a sophisticated understanding of irrigation and horticulture. The Hanging Gardens of Babylon have long been a source of inspiration and fascination for people around the world. They have been the subject of countless works of literature, art, and music, and continue to capture the imaginations of people of all ages. In recent years, there have been efforts to reconstruct the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, using historical accounts and archaeological evidence to create a realistic depiction of what the gardens may have looked like. These efforts have led to the creation of several stunning recreations, including a replica of the gardens at the Singapore Botanic Gardens. Regardless of whether the Hanging Gardens of Babylon were a real or mythical place, they remain a symbol of the beauty and wonder and the power and beauty of human creativity and ingenuity. In conclusion, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon are one of the most mysterious and captivating ancient wonders of the world. While their existence has been debated by historians, Many believe that they were built by King Nebuchadnezzar too to please his wife, who missed the green hills of her homeland. However, the actual location and appearance of the gardens remain unclear, as no archaeological evidence has been found to support their existence. Despite this lack of physical evidence, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon continue to inspire awe and wonder in people today. Their reputation as a symbol of human ingenuity and creativity has endured through the centuries, and they remain a testament to the power of nature and the human spirit to create beautiful things. Perhaps the most enduring legacy of the Hanging Gardens of Babylon is the way in which they continue to inspire the imagination and creativity of people around the world. Whether through artwork, literature, or popular culture, the gardens have become a symbol of human potential and a reminder of the incredible things that we are capable of achieving. While the Hanging Gardens of Babylon may never be fully understood or even proven to have existed, their legacy lives on as a testament to the enduring power of the human spirit. As we continue to explore and uncover the secrets of our ancient past, the story of these magnificent gardens will remain an important part of our shared history and cultural heritage. This documentary is on the Taj Mahal, given by Billy Joey.
panels were designed to create a natural cooling effect, which helped to keep the building cool even during the hot summers. The Taj Mahal is not just a building, but a work of art. The intricate carvings, the calligraphy, and the filigree work are all examples of the artistic excellence of the Mughal period. The carvings on the walls of the Taj Mahal depict scenes from the Quran, which is the holy book of Islam. The calligraphy on the walls is written in Persian and is a tribute to Mumtaz Mahal. The filigree work, which is known as Jali, is made of marble and is designed to allow natural light to enter the building. The construction of the Taj Mahal was not without its challenges. For example, the construction of the Taj Mahal was interrupted by a war between Shah Jahan and his son, Aurangzeb. The war lasted for several years, and during this time, the construction of the Taj Mahal was halted. The construction of the Taj Mahal was also affected by a shortage of funds, which led to delays in the construction process. The Taj Mahal is a remarkable example of Mughal architecture, which is a blend of Indian, Persian, and Islamic styles. The central building is adorned with intricate carvings, calligraphy, and delicate filigree work. The carvings on the walls depict scenes from the Quran and are made of precious stones such as agate, jasper, and lapis lazuli. The calligraphy on the walls is written in Persian and is a tribute to Mumtaz Mahal. The intricate filigree work, which is known as Jali, is made of marble and is designed to allow natural light to enter the building. The Taj Mahal is also famous for its four minarets, which stand tall on each corner of the building. These minarets are 40 meters high and are designed to lean slightly away from the central building to prevent any damage in case of an earthquake. The white marble dome, which is the crown of the Taj Mahal, is also a masterpiece of Mughal architecture. It is 73 meters high and is surrounded by smaller domes and chatras, which are small pavilions that are typically used in Indian architecture. The beauty of the Taj Mahal is not limited to the central building alone. The complex also includes several other structures such as a mosque, a guest house, and a garden. The mosque, which is located on the west side of the complex, is made of red sandstone and is a stunning example of Islamic architecture. The guest house, which is located on the east side of the complex, is also made of red sandstone and was used to accommodate visitors to the Taj Mahal. The garden, which is known as the Charba, is a Persian-style garden that is divided into four quadrants by water channels. The garden is designed to symbolize paradise and is a perfect place to relax and enjoy the beauty of the Taj Mahal. The Taj Mahal has undergone several renovations over the years to maintain its pristine condition which included cleaning the marble, repairing the cracks, and replacing some of the missing pieces.
This documentary is on the Great Wall of China, given by my wife. The Great Wall of China is one of the most iconic structures in the world, stretching over 13,000 miles along the northern borders of China. The wall was built over the course of several centuries, beginning in the 7th century BC and being continuously improved and expanded up until the Ming Dynasty, 1368 to 1644. It was constructed to protect China from invasions by various nomadic tribes and has served as a symbol of Chinese power and ingenuity for thousands of years. Construction of the Great Wall of China was a massive undertaking that required the labor of millions of people. The wall was built using a variety of materials, including stone, brick, tamped earth, and others, and its design and construction techniques varied depending on the local topography and resources. Despite its massive size and strength, the wall was not always able to prevent invasions, but it did serve as a deterrent. and many of them lost their lives during the construction process. Despite these difficulties, the Ming emperors were able to complete the Great Wall and make it one of the most impressive structures in the world. The construction of the Great Wall was a state-run project that was staffed by a large number of conscripted workers, including soldiers, peasants, and prisoners. The conditions for these workers were often harsh, and many of them lost their lives due to the difficult nature of the work and the harsh conditions they faced. One of the biggest challenges faced by the workers was the treacherous terrain along the northern borders of China, where the wall was built. The steep and rugged landscape made it difficult to transport materials and build the wall, and many workers were injured or killed in accidents. In addition, the harsh weather conditions along the northern borders, including harsh winters and scorching summers, made it difficult for the workers to survive. The workers were also subjected to a number of other dangers, including attacks from bandits and wild animals. Some workers were also subjected to harsh treatment from their supervisors, who often punished them harshly for not meeting their quotas or for making mistakes. Despite these difficulties, the workers continued to work on the Great Wall, driven by a sense of duty and a belief in the importance of their work. Many of them lost their lives in the process, and their sacrifices have become an important part of the legacy of the Great Wall of China. One of the most notable examples of the sacrifices made by the workers is the story of a man named Meng Jiangnu. According to legend, Meng's husband was conscripted to work on the Great Wall and died from exhaustion and starvation. When Meng learned of her husband's death, she traveled to the wall to retrieve his body, and her tears and lamentations are said to have caused a section of the wall to crumble, revealing the bones of her husband and the many other workers who had died building the wall. This story is just one of many that illustrate the sacrifices made by the workers who built the Great Wall of China. Their dedication and determination in the face of difficult conditions and countless challenges is a testament to the strength and resilience of the human spirit. The wall was not a single continuous structure, but rather a series of fortifications that were connected over time to create a seamless barrier. Some sections of the wall were constructed along natural barriers, such as rivers and mountains, 
while others were built in areas without such obstacles and required the creation of extensive ramparts and fortifications. The wall was also designed to accommodate military garrisons, watchtowers, and signal fires, allowing for quick communication and response in case of an invasion. Despite its military purpose, the Great Wall of China was not just a simple wall. In many cases, it served as a complex network of fortifications, including barracks, watchtowers, and fortifications that allowed the Chinese army to defend against invaders and maintain control of the territory along the wall. Additionally, the wall was a symbol of Chinese power and ingenuity, showcasing the country's ability to build a massive structure that could withstand the test of time. Over the centuries, the Great Wall of China underwent many changes and renovations, with some sections being lost and others being restored. During the Ming Dynasty, the wall reached its greatest extent, with many sections being rebuilt and improved to make it stronger and more defensible. Despite the wall's size and strength, however, it was not impenetrable, and many invaders were still able to cross it and enter China. Today, the Great Wall of China is a major tourist destination, attracting millions of visitors each year who come to marvel at its size and beauty and to learn about its rich history and cultural significance. The wall is one of the seven wonders of the medieval world and is considered one of the greatest architectural and engineering feats in human history. In recent years, the Great Wall of China has also become a symbol of environmental conservation, as it runs through some of China's most pristine and beautiful landscapes. The Chinese government has taken steps to protect the wall and its surrounding areas, establishing national parks and nature reserves to preserve the area's unique biodiversity and cultural heritage. Despite its age and the many changes it has undergone over the centuries, the Great Wall of China remains one of the most impressive structures in the world. Its size and complexity are a testament to the ingenuity and determination of the Chinese people, and its continued preservation and restoration serve as a reminder of the importance of cultural heritage and environmental conservation. Visiting the Great Wall of China is an unforgettable experience that provides an opportunity to truly appreciate its size, beauty, and cultural significance. Whether you are interested in its history, architecture, engineering, or environmental conservation, the Great Wall of China is a must-see destination that offers something for everyone. This documentary is on the Great Pyramids of Egypt, given by myself.
includes a mortuary temple and a valley temple, as well as three smaller pyramids for his queens. The construction of the pyramids in Egypt is one of the most remarkable engineering achievements in human history. These impressive structures were built over 4,500 years ago during the Old Kingdom period, and they continue to inspire awe and admiration today. While the exact methods used to build the pyramids are still a subject of debate among historians and archaeologists, there are several theories about how they were constructed. One of the most popular theories about the construction of the pyramids is that the blocks used in their construction were quarried from nearby sites and transported to the pyramid complex using sledges and rollers. Workers used copper chisels and stone hammers to cut the blocks out of the bedrock and shape them to the desired size and shape. These blocks were then transported along specially constructed ramps that sloped up to the pyramid's construction site. The ramps used to transport the blocks were likely made of mud bricks and were built at a slight incline to make it easier to move the blocks uphill. As the pyramid grew taller, the ramps would have been extended and repositioned to allow for continued access to the construction site. Some historians believe that workers may have used water to lubricate the ramps, which would have made it easier to move the blocks. Another theory about the construction of the pyramids is that workers used a system of pulleys and levers to lift the blocks into place on the upper levels of the pyramid. This theory suggests that workers used long ropes made from papyrus or palm fibers to hoist the blocks up the pyramid's surface. These ropes would have been attached to wooden beams that acted as levers, allowing the workers to lift the blocks into position. The most complex part of pyramid construction was the process of placing the blocks in a precise position to create the pyramid's shape. The blocks had to be cut to fit together tightly, with precise angles and measurements. Workers likely used a system of surveying tools, such as plumb bobs and measuring ropes, to ensure that each block was placed in the correct position. They may have also used simple machines, such as levers and pulleys, to make it easier to position the blocks accurately. The sheer number of blocks used in the construction of the pyramids is staggering. The Great Pyramid of Khufu is estimated to have used over 2.3 million blocks, each weighing an average of 2.5 tons. It is believed that the blocks were cut and shaped on site, using simple tools and manual labor. This process would have been incredibly time-consuming and labor-intensive, requiring the work of thousands of skilled laborers.
textures and shading that give them a lifelike quality. The process of creating these carvings was incredibly time-consuming and labor-intensive. The walls of the burial chamber were likely smoothed and leveled using plaster, which was then covered in a layer of fine limestone dust. The hieroglyphics and carvings were then traced onto the surface of the limestone using a red pigment, and the workers used their tools to carve away the limestone to create the final design. The carvings in the pyramids were not only created for their aesthetic value, but also for their spiritual significance. The ancient Egyptians believed that these carvings and hieroglyphics held great power and importance, and they were meant to serve as a guide for the pharaoh's journey into the afterlife. The carvings were believed to help the pharaoh navigate the dangers and obstacles of the underworld, and to ensure his safe passage to the afterlife. The Giza pyramids have captured the imaginations of people for centuries, and their mystique continues to fascinate us today. In addition to their historical and cultural significance, the pyramids are also a testament to the ingenuity and skill of the ancient Egyptians. The fact that they were able to construct such massive structures using only simple tools and techniques is truly astounding. There are many other pyramids located throughout Egypt. The Pyramid of Djoser, located at Saqqara, is considered to be the oldest pyramid in Egypt, dating back to around 2670 BCE. The Red Pyramid, located at Dasher, is the third largest pyramid in Egypt and is known for its distinctive red limestone casing stones. The pyramids of Egypt have fascinated people for centuries and continue to captivate us today. They are a testament to the ingenuity and skill of the ancient Egyptians and serve as a reminder of the power and influence of one of the world's oldest civilizations. This documentary is on the Roman Colosseum, given by myself. The Roman Colosseum, also known as the Flavian Amphitheater, is one of the most iconic and recognizable landmarks of the ancient world. Located in the heart of Rome, Italy, the Colosseum is a massive, oval-shaped amphitheater that was built nearly 2,000 years ago. It has become a symbol of the power, grandeur, and brutality of the Roman Empire. Construction of the Colosseum began in AD 72 and took nearly a decade to complete. It was commissioned by Emperor Vespasian, who saw the project as a way to demonstrate his power and win the favor of the Roman people. The Colosseum was designed to be a venue for large-scale public entertainment, including gladiator fights, animal hunts, and mock battles. The site of the Colosseum was originally a large lake, known as the Stagnum Neronis, which had been artificially created by the Emperor Nero for his palace. Vespasian ordered the draining of the lake and the leveling of the ground to make way for the new amphitheater. The Colosseum was built using a combination of concrete, brick, and stone. The outer walls were made of travertine limestone, a type of stone that was readily available in the surrounding hills. The interior was made of brick and concrete, a combination that allowed for greater strength and durability. The Colosseum was designed to be a massive, oval-shaped structure that could seat up to 50,000 spectators. It was divided into four levels, each with a different type of seating arrangement. The lowest level, known as the Hypogeum, was used for staging and storage. It contained a complex system of corridors, tunnels, and elevators that allowed for the movement of animals and scenery. The second level was reserved for the wealthy and the ruling classes. It was decorated with elaborate stucco and marble work and featured a covered colonnade that provided shade and shelter. The third level was reserved for the middle class, while the fourth level was open to the general public. The Colosseum was equipped with a sophisticated system of drainage and ventilation that allowed for the easy flow of water and air. It also had a complex system of retractable awnings that could be used to provide shade and protection from the elements. One of the most impressive features of the Colosseum was its roof, which was made of a series of wooden beams and canvas awnings. The roof could be opened and closed using a system of ropes and pulleys, allowing for the easy control of light and air. 
The construction of the Colosseum was a massive undertaking that required the labor of thousands of workers. It is estimated that over 100,000 cubic meters of stone and 300 tons of iron were used in the construction of the Colosseum. The workforce was made up of skilled craftsmen, such as stonemasons, carpenters, and metal workers, as well as unskilled laborers, such as slaves and prisoners of war. Many of the workers were housed in nearby barracks and provided with food and clothing. The construction of the Colosseum was not without its challenges. During the construction, there were several major earthquakes that caused damage to the structure. In AD 217, the Colosseum was struck by lightning, which caused a fire that destroyed a significant portion of the wooden roof. The Colosseum is an engineering marvel, standing 48 meters, 157 feet, tall and covering an area of over 6 acres. It is made of travertine limestone and concrete and could seat up to 50,000 spectators. The Colosseum was designed with a complex system of corridors, tunnels, and stairways to allow for easy movement of people and animals. The Colosseum was also equipped with a sophisticated system of elevators and pulleys that could be used to hoist animals and scenery up to the arena floor. This allowed for elaborate and dramatic spectacles, such as recreations of famous battles and mythological scenes. The most famous events held in the Colosseum were the gladiator fights. These battles were staged between trained fighters, many of whom were slaves or prisoners of war. They were armed with various weapons, such as swords, shields, and spears, and fought each other to the death in front of a bloodthirsty crowd. The gladiator fights were brutal and often ended in death, but they were also highly popular. They were seen as a symbol of Roman power and the strength of the empire. Gladiators were admired for their bravery and skill, and the most successful fighters could become rich and famous. The gladiator fights at the Roman Colosseum were one of the most popular and enduring forms of entertainment in ancient Rome. For over 400 years, gladiators fought to the death in front of tens of thousands of spectators, many of whom were eager to see blood and violence. The gladiators were typically slaves or prisoners of war who had been trained in combat and armed with a variety of weapons, including swords, shields, and tridents. They were often forced to fight against each other or against wild animals, such as lions, tigers, and bears. The gladiator fights were organized into different types of contests, each with its own set of rules and traditions. Some contests were designed to showcase the skills of the gladiators, while others were intended to be purely violent and bloody. One of the most popular types of contests was the munis, which was a public spectacle that was usually held to commemorate a particular occasion, such as a military victory or the birthday of a prominent citizen. The munis typically featured multiple bouts of gladiatorial combat, as well as other forms of entertainment, such as animal hunts and chariot races. Another popular type of contest was the Venatio, which was a form of animal hunt that involved the release of wild animals, such as lions and elephants, into the arena. The hunters, typically armed with spears and swords, would attempt to kill the animals while avoiding being killed themselves. Perhaps the most infamous type of contest was the Nomachia, which was a mock naval battle that was fought in a flooded arena. The Nomachia was an incredibly expensive and elaborate spectacle that required the construction of large-scale models of warships and the flooding of the arena with water. The gladiatorial contests at the Colosseum were not without controversy, however. Many Romans viewed the spectacle as cruel and barbaric, and there were numerous attempts to ban or limit the fights. Despite these criticisms, the gladiator fights remained a popular form of entertainment in Rome for centuries, and they continue to capture the imaginations of people today. The gladiators themselves have become legendary figures, romanticized in popular culture as symbols of bravery, honor, and courage. In recent years, there has been a growing interest in the historical accuracy of the gladiator fights, as well as the conditions under which the gladiators lived and trained.
While much of the history of the gladiatorial contests has been lost to time, historians and archaeologists have been able to piece together a more accurate picture of the lives of the gladiators and the role that they played in the Roman Empire. Animal hunts, also known as venations, were a popular form of entertainment in the Roman Colosseum. These spectacles involved the release of wild animals into the arena, such as lions, tigers, bears, and even crocodiles, for the purpose of hunting and killing them. The hunts were often held in conjunction with gladiatorial games, and were meant to showcase the bravery and skill of the hunters, who were usually prisoners or slaves. The hunters were armed with a variety of weapons, such as spears, swords, and bows, and would attempt to kill the animals while avoiding being killed themselves. The animals used in the hunts were often brought in from all corners of the Roman Empire, and included exotic creatures such as giraffes and elephants. The hunts were seen as a way for the Roman Empire to demonstrate its dominance over the natural world, and were often used as a form of propaganda to impress foreign visitors. The hunts were incredibly popular with the crowds, who were often eager to see the spectacle of humans battling against ferocious beasts. The animals were usually starved before the hunt to make them more aggressive, and the hunters were often at a disadvantage due to the size and strength of their opponents. The hunts were not without controversy, however, and there were many who viewed them as cruel and barbaric. Some critics argued that the hunts were a waste of resources and animal life, and that the spectacle was a distraction from more pressing social issues. Despite these criticisms, the animal hunts continued to be held in the Colosseum for centuries, and even became more elaborate and grandiose over time. The hunts were eventually banned by Emperor Honorius in 404 AD, as part of a broader effort to curb the excesses of the Roman Empire. The Colosseum was also used for mock battles, known as Nomachiae. They were one of the most spectacular and elaborate forms of entertainment held in the Roman Colosseum. These mock battles were staged using specially built pools, which were flooded with water and used to recreate naval battles. The word nomachia comes from the Greek word for naval battle, and the first recorded nomachia was held by Julius Caesar in 46 BC. These battles were often staged to commemorate special events or celebrations, and were used to demonstrate the naval power and skill of the Roman Empire. The Nomachiae were typically fought by teams of trained sailors and soldiers, who were tasked with recreating famous naval battles or inventing new scenarios. The battles were incredibly dangerous, and many participants lost their lives in the process. The ships used in the battles were often scaled-down versions of real warships, but were still equipped with weapons such as ballistae and catapults. The Nomachiae were immensely popular with the Roman people, who were often eager to see the spectacle of naval battles fought on dry land. The battles were also used as a way for the Roman Empire to demonstrate its military might and to impress foreign visitors with the scale and grandeur of the event. Despite their popularity, the Nomachiae were not without controversy, and there were many who viewed them as a waste of resources and human life. Some critics argued that the battles were a distraction from more pressing social issues, and that the money and resources used to stage them could have been better spent on improving the lives of the Roman people. The Nomachiae were eventually banned by Emperor Trajan in the 2nd century AD, as part of a broader effort to curb the excesses of the Roman Empire. Today, the mock naval battles in the Roman Colosseum remain a testament to the spectacle and grandeur of the ancient world, and are a vivid reminder of the power and influence of the Roman Empire. Despite its popularity, the Colosseum was also the subject of controversy and criticism. Many people saw the gladiator fights and other violent spectacles as cruel and barbaric. Some writers and philosophers, such as Seneca and Pliny the Elder, spoke out against the practice of using humans and animals for entertainment. Over time, the Colosseum fell into disuse and disrepair. It was used as a quarry for building materials and suffered damage from earthquakes and other natural disasters. Today, only a portion of the original structure remains, 
but the Colosseum remains a powerful symbol of the grandeur and brutality of ancient Rome. In recent years, there have been concerted efforts to restore and preserve the Colosseum for future generations. These efforts have included a variety of initiatives, from structural repairs to the implementation of new technologies for monitoring and maintaining the site. One of the most significant restoration projects was the cleaning of the Colosseum's exterior in the 1990s, which removed years of grime and pollution that had accumulated on the structure. This project, which was funded by the Italian government and the European Union, involved a team of experts who used a combination of chemical and mechanical cleaning methods to restore the Colosseum's original white color. In addition to the exterior cleaning, there have also been efforts to restore the interior of the Colosseum. This has included the installation of new lighting systems and the restoration of the underground chambers and passages that were used by gladiators and animals during the spectacles. One of the most ambitious restoration projects was the restoration of the Colosseum's fourth and fifth levels, which had been closed to the public for centuries due to safety concerns. This project, which was completed in 2016, involved the installation of new walkways, elevators, and lighting systems, allowing visitors to experience the Colosseum from a new perspective. In addition to these physical restoration efforts, there have also been efforts to use technology to monitor and maintain the Colosseum. This has included the use of sensors and other monitoring devices to detect structural weaknesses and other potential hazards as well as the implementation of a new ticketing system that allows visitors to reserve their tickets online in advance. Despite these efforts, the Colosseum remains a fragile and vulnerable structure, and continued preservation efforts will be necessary to ensure its survival for future generations. This will require a combination of government funding, private investment, and international cooperation, as well as ongoing research and innovation in the fields of restoration and conservation. Today, the Roman Colosseum remains a popular tourist destination, attracting millions of visitors each year. It is a powerful symbol of the ancient world and a testament to the enduring legacy of the Roman Empire. This documentary is on Chichen Itza, given by my wife.
This documentary is on the Angkor Wat temple given by myself. The Angkor Wat temple complex is an architectural masterpiece located in the Siem Reap province of Cambodia. It was built by the Khmer Empire during the 12th century and is the largest religious monument in the world. The complex is spread across an area of approximately 400 acres and is a prime example of the classical Khmer architecture style. The complex consists of several temples, buildings, and reservoirs, with Angkor Wat being the most prominent and well-known of all. Angkor Wat was built as a temple dedicated to the Hindu god Vishnu, but it later became a Buddhist temple during the 16th century. The temple's architecture is a testament to the Khmer Empire's ingenuity and creativity, with its five towers representing the peaks of Mount Meru, a sacred mountain in Hindu mythology. The complex is also decorated with intricate carvings and bar-reliefs that depict scenes from Hindu mythology and Khmer history. Fields. The hydraulic system is a testament to the Khmer Empire's engineering prowess and is considered to be one of the most advanced systems of its time. Despite its architectural and engineering marvels, the Angkor Wat temple complex went into decline after the fall of the Khmer Empire in the 15th century. The complex was abandoned and left to the elements, and the jungle began to reclaim the area. It wasn't until the 19th century that the temple complex was rediscovered by Western explorers, and efforts were made to restore and preserve it. Today, the Angkor Wat temple complex is one of the most popular tourist destinations in Southeast Asia. Visitors from all over the world come to marvel at its architecture and explore its rich history. The complex is also a UNESCO World Heritage Site and is considered to be one of the most important cultural landmarks in the world. However, the popularity of the Angkor Wat Temple Complex has also led to concerns about its conservation. The increasing number of tourists visiting the complex has put pressure on its fragile ecosystem, and there are fears that the heavy foot traffic and pollution could damage the temple complex irreparably. The Cambodian government and various conservation organizations are working together to mitigate these risks and ensure that the Angkor Wat Temple Complex remains a cultural treasure for future generations to enjoy. In conclusion, the Angkor Wat Temple Complex is a remarkable testament to the Khmer Empire's creativity, ingenuity, and engineering prowess. Its architectural and engineering marvels, intricate carvings, and rich history make it one of the most important cultural landmarks in the world. While the complex faces challenges to its conservation, efforts are being made to ensure that it remains a cultural treasure for generations to come. This documentary is on Stonehenge, given by myself.
Incas did not use any kind of mortar to hold the stones in place, instead relying on the weight of the stones and the precise fit to keep them in position. This technique not only creates a beautiful finish, but also makes the buildings more earthquake resistant. The stones used at Machu Picchu were quarried from nearby sources, and the Incas took great care in selecting the right stones for each building. They chose stones that were the right shape and size for the particular location, and they also selected stones with specific colors and textures to create a desired effect. Some of the stones used at Machu Picchu are so large that it is difficult to imagine how they were moved into place. The Incas are known to have used a variety of techniques to move the stones, including ramps, levers, and ropes made from natural fibers. The stonework at Machu Picchu is not just impressive for its precision and beauty, but also for its durability. The buildings at Machu Picchu have withstood earthquakes and heavy rains for centuries, thanks in part to the quality of the stonework. The Incas also incorporated drainage systems into their buildings to prevent water damage, another example of their functional design. The stonework at Machu Picchu is a testament to the ingenuity and skill of the Inca people. Their use of ashlar masonry and other stonework techniques created structures that are not only beautiful but also functional and durable. The precision of the stonework is truly remarkable, and it is a testament to the Inca's ability to work with the natural environment and make the most of the materials available to them. The stonework at Machu Picchu is a source of inspiration for architects and builders today, and it is a reminder of the incredible achievements of ancient civilizations. The buildings at Machu Picchu are not only visually stunning, but also demonstrate the remarkable engineering and architectural expertise of the Inca civilization. The buildings at Machu Picchu are divided into two main areas, the urban sector and the agricultural sector. The urban sector comprises a series of interconnected buildings and plazas, while the agricultural sector includes terraced fields and irrigation canals. The urban sector of Machu Picchu is the most impressive part of the site, featuring a series of intricate stone buildings that are built into the mountainside. The buildings were constructed using the ashlar masonry technique, which involves cutting and shaping stones to fit together perfectly without the use of mortar. This technique allowed the Inca builders
sacred, and that they were home to powerful deities who could bring good fortune or disaster to their people. They also believed that Machu Picchu was a place where the gods could communicate with humanity. One of the most important buildings in Machu Picchu is the Temple of the Sun. This temple was built to worship Inti, the Inca sun god. The temple has a unique design that allows sunlight to enter a chamber at the center of the building only during the summer solstice. During this time, the sunlight creates a beam that illuminates an altar in the chamber, which was used for offerings and ceremonies. This alignment was a remarkable feat of engineering and astronomy, and it shows the Inca's deep knowledge of the natural world. Another important building at Machu Picchu is the Intihuatana Stone. This stone was believed to be a sacred anchor point that tied the site to the heavens. It was used for astronomical observations and was believed to have a powerful spiritual energy. The name Intihuatana means hitching post of the sun in the Quechua language, which was the language of the Incas. The stone has four sides, each aligned with a cardinal direction, and its shadow moves along the rock during the day, marking the passing of time. The royal tomb is another significant structure at Machu Picchu. This building was a funerary temple for the Inca royalty and was used for the mummification of their bodies. It is believed that the mummies were placed in the temple and were worshipped as divine ancestors. The temple is adorned with intricate stonework and its interior contains a large stone altar that was used for offerings and ceremonies. The sacred plaza is the heart of Machu Picchu and is believed to have been a central location for religious ceremonies and festivals. The plaza is surrounded by important buildings, including the Temple of the Sun, the Royal Tomb, and the Main Temple. It is also surrounded by several small platforms that were used for offerings and other religious activities. The Inca Empire was deeply spiritual, and Machu Picchu was an essential center for their religious practices. The site was believed to be a portal between the physical world and the spiritual realm, and it was used for worship, prayer, and contemplation. The careful alignment of the buildings with the movements of the sun and stars, the precise stonework, and the beautiful architecture all attest to the Inca's deep reverence for their gods and their belief in the power of their sacred site. Today, Machu Picchu remains an awe-inspiring place that continues to inspire wonder and reverence in visitors from all over the world. Despite being one of the most famous archaeological sites in the world, Machu Picchu remains shrouded in mystery, with many unanswered questions about its purpose and history. One of the main mysteries surrounding Machu Picchu is its purpose. While many theories exist, there is still no clear consensus among archaeologists and historians. Some believe that Machu Picchu was a royal retreat for Inca emperors, while others argue that it was a pilgrimage site for spiritual seekers. Others speculate that it was a site for astronomical observations or served as a military outpost to protect the Inca Empire. The reasons for the abandonment of Machu Picchu are also unclear. While it is widely accepted that the site was abandoned during the Spanish conquest of Peru in the 16th century, the reasons for this abandonment are still debated. Some historians speculate that the site was abandoned due to a smallpox epidemic that decimated the Inca population, while others argue that it was abandoned due to environmental factors such as drought or soil erosion. The lack of written records from the Inca Empire also contributes to the mystery surrounding Machu Picchu. Unlike other ancient civilizations such as the Egyptians or Greeks, the Inca Empire did not have a system of writing, meaning that much of what is known about Inca culture comes from oral traditions and archaeological evidence. In addition to these historical mysteries, there are also ongoing debates surrounding the preservation and restoration of Machu Picchu. The site faces many challenges, including overcrowding, erosion, and environmental damage. 
In recent years, the Peruvian government has taken steps to limit the number of visitors to the site and to improve infrastructure to better protect the fragile ecosystem. However, some argue that these efforts have not gone far enough and that more needs to be done to protect the site for future generations. Despite these mysteries and debates, Machu Picchu remains an iconic symbol of Inca culture. as the statue is located in a humid and windy environment. One of the major challenges of the construction was the installation of the statue's arms. The arms of the statue are made of reinforced concrete, and each arm weighs more than 40 metric tons. The workers had to use a complex system of pulleys and ropes to lift the arms into place. Another challenge was the installation of the statue's head and face. The face of the statue is more than five feet tall, and it had to be installed in several pieces. The workers used a series of scaffolds and cranes to lift the pieces into place and assemble them. Despite the challenges, the construction of the statue was completed in 1931, and it was inaugurated on October 12th of that year. The statue was an instant success, attracting millions of visitors from around the world. It became an important cultural and historical landmark in Brazil, and a symbol of the country's rich cultural heritage. Today, visitors to Christ the Redeemer can reach the summit of Corcovado Mountain by a train or van that runs through the Tijuca Forest National Park. The ride up the mountain is a breathtaking experience as visitors can enjoy panoramic views of the city of Rio de Janeiro and the surrounding landscape. At the top of the mountain, visitors can climb a series of stairs to reach the base of the statue, 
where they can admire its majestic beauty up close. Christ the Redeemer is not only a religious symbol but also a cultural and historical landmark. The statue has been featured in numerous films, books, and songs, and it has become a symbol of Brazil's unique cultural identity. The statue also represents an important period in Brazilian history, as it was built during a time of great social and political change in the country. Over the years, Christ the Redeemer has undergone several renovations to preserve its beauty and ensure its safety. The statue is exposed to harsh weather conditions, including strong winds, heavy rainfall, and extreme temperature fluctuations. These conditions can cause erosion and damage to the statue's exterior and structure. In 1980, the first major renovation of the statue was carried out. The renovation was aimed at reinforcing the structure of the statue and repairing the damage caused by years of exposure to the elements. The renovation included the installation of new lighting systems and the replacement of the soapstone exterior. In 2002, another renovation was carried out, this time focused on the statue's access and visitor facilities. The renovation included the construction of a new elevator system, which allows visitors to reach the top of the mountain in just a few minutes. The renovation also included the construction of new observation decks and the installation of new lighting systems. In 2010, another renovation was carried out to celebrate the statue's 80th anniversary. The renovation included the installation of new lighting systems that illuminate the statue at night, creating a stunning visual display that can be seen from miles away. The renovation also included the installation of new visitor facilities, including a new restaurant and souvenir shop. In 2014, a major renovation was carried out to prepare the statue for the World Cup and the Olympic Games, which were held in Brazil. The renovation included the installation of new safety systems, including a lightning rod and a fire suppression system. The renovation also included the installation of new observation decks and the construction of a new access road to the summit of the mountain. In 2021, the most recent renovation of the statue was completed. The renovation was aimed at preserving the statue's cultural heritage and improving its accessibility. The renovation included the installation of new interactive exhibits that tell the story of the statue's construction and history. The renovation also included the construction of new pedestrian paths and the installation of new lighting systems. The statue remains a beloved cultural landmark in Brazil and a symbol of the country's unique cultural identity. It continues to attract millions of visitors from around the world, who come to marvel at its beauty and significance. The renovations ensure that the statue will continue to stand tall for generations to come, inspiring people with its message of peace and love. This documentary is on Zeus at Olympia, given by myself. The statue of Zeus at Olympia was a massive masterpiece of ancient Greek art that was once considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. The statue was located in the Temple of Zeus at Olympia, a religious sanctuary located in the western part of Greece. It was created by the sculptor Phidias in the 5th century BC and was famous for its immense size and exquisite craftsmanship. The statue was made entirely of ivory and gold and stood over 40 feet tall. It was situated on a throne made of cedar wood and was adorned with precious stones and metals. The statue depicted Zeus, the king of the gods in Greek mythology, seated on his throne with a scepter in one hand and a figure of Nike, the goddess of victory, in the other. The throne was decorated with carvings of mythological creatures, including lions, griffins, and sphinxes. The statue of Zeus was created to be the centerpiece of the
The statue appeared to glow. Once the statue was complete, it was placed in the Temple of Zeus at Olympia. The temple was designed to showcase the statue, with the roof open to the sky so that the statue was illuminated by natural light. The statue became an object of wonder and awe for the people of Greece, who traveled from far and wide to see it. Unfortunately, the statue of Zeus did not survive the ravages of time. The Temple of Zeus at Olympia was destroyed by a series of earthquakes in the 5th and 6th centuries AD, and the statue was lost. Today, all that remains of the statue are a few fragments, including the base and some of the ornaments that decorated the throne. Despite its loss, the statue of Zeus at Olympia remains an important cultural and historical artifact. It is a testament to the incredible artistic skill of the ancient Greeks, and it serves as a reminder of the important role that religion played in ancient Greek society. The statue was also a symbol of the power and majesty of Zeus, the king of the gods, and it represented the height of ancient Greek civilization. The legacy of the statue of Zeus can still be felt today. The ancient Olympic Games, which were held in Olympia in honor of Zeus, have inspired the modern Olympic Games, which continue to be one of the world's most important sporting events. The ruins of the Temple of Zeus at Olympia are also a popular tourist destination, attracting visitors from around the world who come to see the place where the statue of Zeus once stood. In conclusion, the statue of Zeus at Olympia stands as a testament to the ancient Greeks' incredible artistic skill and religious devotion. The sculpture's immense size, intricate craftsmanship, and use of precious materials made it a wonder of the ancient world. Despite being lost to history, its legacy remains strong, with the ruins of the Temple of Zeus attracting visitors from around the world. The statue also inspired the modern Olympic Games, which continue to be an important global sporting event. The statue of Zeus at Olympia is a reminder of the heights of ancient Greek civilization and its lasting impact on our world today. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel to keep up with the latest videos. Thank you.